Alright, this is going to be number two of a series of a tutorials in which I teach you everything there is to learn about Bitcoin and altcoin developing. This one's going to be all about blocks, and if there's enough time, I'll go into detail about Merkle roots, Merkle trees, and something called a nonce. You can think of a blockchain as kind of like a brick wall. It's a way of splitting data into chunks such that each new chunk gets layered on top of old chunks. And in the same way as, say, a brick wall, to get back and change old blocks of data would require you to take all the bricks off the wall which are above it. Now when you put a new block into the blockchain it requires some computationally expensive task to verify. I'll go into details on how exactly this verification happens in future tutorials and when I've made that tutorial I'll make sure there's a link to it here but for now all you need to know is that to set a new block into the blockchain requires a computationally difficult task to be completed. Now having to perform some kind of computationally difficult task to set a new block into the blockchain makes it so that unpicking the blockchain and putting some kind of false data into it somewhere is incredibly difficult because other nodes in the network are constantly securing the correct blockchain so you would have to effectively outperform the rest of the entire network to inject some malicious data. So blocks have something called a block header, which includes information needed by the Bitcoin network to perform different operations and functions and effectively build the blockchain. The block header is serialized as an 80 byte chunk of data. The word serialized refers to the way that the data is transmitted on the network. So for the header, you can think of it as being sent as an 80 byte chunk. You can see in the developer reference here that it says that the header format is part of the consensus rules. So that means that nodes operating on the Bitcoin network must conform to this 80 byte block header size or the transmission will not be accepted by anyone else on the network. The block header includes six fields. Each of them include information which the Bitcoin network needs to use the blocks and construct the blockchain. The first one is which version of block validation rules that the Bitcoin node should follow to validate the block. There are four main versions that have existed on the Bitcoin network. There's version 1, which was the original set of rules introduced by Satoshi in 2009. Version 2, which introduced some requirements to do with block height, which is the number of blocks between this block and the first block in the blockchain. Version 3, which introduced stricter rules of encoding ECDSA signatures, which are a form of encryption used in blocks, and version 4. The next thing in the block header is the previous block header hash. Remember when I said that the blockchain is kind of like a brick wall, where each new block secures the last one and the one before that? They are locked into place by the other blocks. Well, for these blocks to verify each other, they need to have a reference to the previous block header hash, which is a value generated by the difficult computational problem I talked about earlier. The hash of a block is based on the information within the block. All of that information put together and then hashed, so to speak, using this computation result in a string of values. If any of the information in the block is changed and then rehashed, then the resulting string of values will be completely different, and the next block in the blockchain will have a previous block header hash value, which is different to the value produced by the changed block. When this happens, we know that something has ch been changed, and we can disregard that blockchain as being incorrect. Other nodes on the network will have a correct blockchain that we will then use instead, and disregard the blockchain with the invalid block. So the way it works is it takes the output of a SHA-256 encryption function of the previous block header and then does SHA-256 encryption on it again. I guess you could say it's doubly secure. SHA-256 is one of the encryption algorithms that Bitcoin uses a lot to provide ridiculously secure blocks that would essentially take jillions of years to decrypt. I'll be making a video in the future detailing the exact steps of SHA-256, but for now just remember that SHA-256 is a super secure encryption algorithm. So to conclude on block header hashes, you can view them as kind of a way that blocks in the blockchain remain secure by referencing an unchangeable hash that the previous block has. You can look at this like each block in the blockchain effectively secures the previous block. Older blocks in the blockchain become more secure as time goes by. Now the reason that the version number takes up 4 bytes of the header is that 4 bytes can represent 2 to the power of 32 values. So there can be 2 to the 32 changes to the block version before the block header would have to be changed in size in some way. Which is something like 4.2 billion versions, so I think that's probably plenty. Um, th the previous block header hash, however, requires 32 bytes because it's a 32 character long array. The same thing goes to the next field, which is known as the Merkle root hash. 
The Merkle root is the result of all of the transactions within a block being hashed together using a data structure called a Merkle tree. I'll go into detail about Merkle trees in another video very soon, and when I do, I'll link it back here. It is hashed in, in the same way as the previous block header hash, in so much as the SHA-256 hash of it is taken twice. This is done for the same reason the blocks shouldn't be changed. We wouldn't want any of the transactions within the list of transactions to be changed either, so they need to get their fair share of hashing too. The next field in the block header is one that I personally find really interesting, and that is the Unix epoch time. What the Unix epoch time is, is a way to represent the current time as an integer. Normally when we think of time, we might think like 12.41 p.m., 12th of April 2006, but some clever computer science people back in the 70s realized that our traditional way of looking at time had a bunch of problems to do with leap seconds and so on, so they figured out a way to calculate the time in seconds from 1970. So for example, the the Unix epoch time when I'm recording this video is 15111924175. The end bits field describes the target threshold of the difficult computational problem which is solved to verify the block. You can think of the difficult problem as a number which is the result of some hashed values. Just to illustrate this, I'll give you a simplified version of what's going on here. Imagine I give you the number 7, and I say to you, OK, what number multiplied by 7 results in a number where the first three digits in the number are all 1? So you might guess, well, OK, is it 7 times 2? Well, no, because the first digit of the result is 1, sure, but the second digit is 4, so that fails the target threshold. So then you might eventually try 7 times 159, of which the answer is 1113 but it will take you a bunch of guesses to get there, hence the computational difficulty of the task. The target threshold represents how many specific values have to be found as the result of the hash of the hashed values. So a more difficult target threshold might be if the result of the computation had to start with six ones or seven ones rather than an easy target threshold, which might just be one, two, or three ones. So that brings us to the nonce. In the example I gave, the nonce would be the guess which resulted in the answer that met the target threshold. That nonce is needed to be included in the block header so that when the block is verified, the computational problem doesn't have to be redone, it can just be checked. It also proves that the miner, so to speak, of that block found the correct answer because they provided it. So I think I'll end this video here because it's starting to get kind of long. In the next video, I will go further into detail on the topics discussed in this video. Don't forget to like the video if you want to see more and subscribe to this channel to learn everything you need to know about developing for Bitcoin or creating your own altcoins.